grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, as you read the book as a whole, it's interesting because there's this play going back and forth all through the Gospels, and at times Luke has Jesus addressing the crowds and the multitudes. And then after he addresses the crowds and the multitudes, the scene shifts and his audience becomes just his disciples and his followers. And when he's addressing the crowds and the multitude, he begins to proclaim this kingdom of God. And you have these wonderful, gracious stories of what God is already doing in the world for his people. And then after people begin to hear and believe that, then he begins to talk to his disciples. And those of us who choose to follow. And then he begins to tell them, if that's what you choose to follow, then this is what your life will begin to look like. What does it mean for you and I to live a life in faith? And in all of this uncertainty and changing and confusion and the dangers and the hopes, and when you look at what the disciples are facing in front of them as they begin to say, yes, we're going to live in this new kingdom of God, and what they face from the kingdom of Rome, there is a huge amount to be anxious over. And it's in the midst of this, Jesus tells his disciples, tells us, have no fear. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And you notice when he says that, he says it in present tense. It is already done. The kingdom of God is already here. And it is already yours. And God in freedom has already given it to you. Faith is now how do I begin to live my life trusting what God has already done. Sort of interesting, in the New Testament... The Greek word for faith is pistos. Pistos in the Greek is almost always a verb. But when you translate the Greek into English, the term pistos almost always has to end up being a noun. And it's interesting, when you change it from a verb into a noun, it sort of changes our whole concept of what faith is. And so in English, I end up saying, I have faith, or I am keeping the faith. But that's not really the New Testament understanding. The New Testament understanding would be, I am faithing. That doesn't make any sense in English. But it makes a lot of sense in the, I am faithing, or I am living my life faithingly. And it is this sense of we are doing something. It isn't something I necessarily believe with my head, doctrinal stuff. That's what happens when we turn it into a noun. And we end up thinking faith is believing the Apostles' Creed. Or, growing up as good Lutherans, memorizing Luther's small catechism and ending each one, this is most certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's a verb, it becomes this ongoing, constant, changing journey that Christ initiates and we now add to our lives as we go forth day by day. You see it so beautifully in this Genesis reading. And Hebrews picks that up. Abraham has done all the things that the Lord says. He leaves the land of earth. He believes his promises. And yet he's still at the age, ripe age in his 90s, looks to God and says, how is this going to happen? I don't see this kingdom thing. It just doesn't seem to be. And it doesn't mean that Abraham didn't have doubts. It didn't mean he didn't under, he, that he somehow he didn't understand how God... And finally God comes and says, but look up at the stars, and if you can count them, that's how many your descendants will be. I don't think Abraham left that confrontation knowing any more than he entered it. <laughs> he had no clue how this was going to happen. And yet somehow, trusting that word of God, it began to reshape his whole life around it. And that became a verb. And as it becomes a verb, that action in his life, it is reckoned unto him as righteousness. Not that he did it right, but this is the right relationship. That I bring my doubts and my confusions, my fears, everything that I am, trusting the word of this God above all else. I heard the story of two scientists who went into northern Washington to, there were bald eagles on a mountain cliff, and as they went there, there was a chick. I don't know, do you call bald eagles chicks? I don't know. 
a chick in the mountainside, and the mother and father had abandoned or died and whatnot, and the chick was going to die, but they couldn't get to it. And the guy had a little boy, and the two scientists said, we will put you in a harvest, we'll lower you over the end, we'll hold onto the rope, and you can get the chick and bring it up. And the boy said, no way. <laughs> So being good scientists, they showed them the strap and the warning, you know, the, the pressure points and all that, and I assured him that the rope was plenty strong enough, we will lower you down, and he said, no way. And they finally said, well, if we pay you twice as much money, and blah, 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 he says, no way. And finally they said, what do we have to do so you'll go over the cliff? <laughs> and the boy said, let my father hold the other end of the rope, not you. See, he knew that his father loved him. And whatever happened, that relationship would shape everything that happened from that point on. And from faithing in that father, he began to go over that edge. That's what our faith is. This is the faith thing we are called to do. To know that God has the other end of that rope. And because he has that end of the rope, we are free to go over, to begin to expand, to explore knowing in the fear and the uncertainty and all that awaits us. That love of God will always be in the center. In Central America, they found a fish. It's called the uh, Cuatro Ojos. Cuatro Ojos, which means literally four eyes. It's not that it has four eyes, but each set of eyes has two lenses. The one lens points up, and the other lens points down. So at the same time, it looks up for food, and at the same time, it looks down for predators. It kind of like the eyes of faith. We have two lenses in our eyes. One is on this kingdom of God where we are fed and we are nourished and we are forgiven. The other is we look very skillfully and carefully at this world and chart our way through it knowing the presence of this God is always there. One of my misconceptions about faith growing up in the Lutheran church, I always believed if I was faithful and if I did exactly what I was supposed to as God's child, Somehow or another, my life would be better, nicer, easier, or at least neater. But it never seemed to work out that way. And it took me a long time to realize faith doesn't mean the world changes for me. Faith means I begin to change who I am in this world. Because I know this God. Because I know this God has the end of my rope. It begins to change me. And as a changed person, I now enter into the darkness of this world. Jesus tells these two wonderful parables, parables of the watchful servant or the watchful slave. And he ends them, if you don't know, if you, you better know the hour when the master is coming home. Because when he comes home, he better find you doing the work that he entrusted you with. Every time I read that parable, I always thought it was like a pop quiz. <laughs> Jesus was going to show up, and like that day in school where you sit down and the teacher says, put your books under your desk, take out a piece of paper, we're having a pop quiz. It is kind of like Jesus coming in. I know you're supposed to be studying and reading chapter 12 and 13 and 14. Now we're going to find out if you've really done what you're supposed to do. But you see, I'm not sure that's how we're supposed to read it. And I'm not sure we're supposed to read it that way because how can that understanding of a pop quiz go with the first thing Jesus said, which was, have no fear. First thing that happens when a teacher told me you're having a pop quiz is I would go into a cold sweat in a panic because I knew I was in big trouble. But this isn't a pop quiz. Jesus begins with this sense of, have no fear. The kingdom has already been given to you. If there is a pop quiz, you've already got an A. Because before the service even began, I said, your sins in their entirety are forgiven. You are free to now come and live in this kingdom of God. You are free to come and live in this kingdom with your life centered in love, forgiveness, care, and joy. But be ready. Because when you leave here in this kingdom, that God is going to show up. He is going to show up at unexpected times, suddenly. And there are going to be moments for you to be the love of God to someone else. There are going to be those opportunities for you to show the forgiveness that you have been given. There will be times when you become the caregiver as you have been cared for. There will be times when you initiate the compassion that you have received. And each time you do that, 
the Son of Man, this Jesus is proclaimed. And all the people who hear have no reason to fear. Not because the world is not a fearful place, but because in a fearful and in an uncertain world, we know. We know who has hold of the world. Keep faith.